Howdy, this is Todd Conklin. Welcome to the Pre Accident Podcast. This is episode three. Let's call it Martha Continues. So let me give you a little background on this because I think it's worthwhile. When we recorded the first podcast uh, interview with Martha Acosta, we went about 20 minutes, which is our target length. That was fine. And it was snowing like crazy. And it's funny, if you listen in the background, you can barely hear me, a little technical issue there. And you can hear the snow plows going down the street, back and forth, back and forth. And it really did. It, it snowed quite a bit that day. It's funny, when we uh, got done, we were sitting around talking, and Martha said, ah, what we should have talked about was this notion of thinking fast and slow, thinking fast and slow, systems one, systems two thinking. And so I immediately jumped to Daniel Kahneman, the, the book Thinking Fast and Slow, which is a, a must read for you guys. If you haven't read it, you probably should. It's, it's quite remarkable. And I was really curious to, uh, you know, listen to what Martha had to say about this notion of fast and slow, especially as it relates to our ability to predict and prevent. So I said, well, you know, we could just do another one. And so she said, OK. And I think partially because it was snowing really awful. And partially because she had a big old glass of hot tea, she said, all right, I'll go for it. I'll try it. So we turned everything back on. I fixed as much as I possibly could the technical issue. I think you'll notice my voice sounds a little louder in this second one. And had a really good 20-more-minute conversation around this notion of how organizations think when they think about themselves. Now, let me say that again. How organizations think when they think about themselves. This is pretty... Um, I think you'll find this pretty interesting. Uh, at every single level, I think you'll find it pretty interesting. So without much more ado and much more fanfare, let's jump in and listen to what Martha has to say about Systems 1 and Systems 2 thinking. This is the Pre-Accident Podcast. Martha returns. The way that I was thinking about the System 1, System 2 thing with respect to pain is that we are constantly going around in this fast systems one thinking. That's performance. You know, we're taking what we already know and we're applying it to the current situation. And that's what organizations love because you're quick and you're efficient and you're performing. But, <laughs> um, but that's also where latent organizational weaknesses get created because you're not paying attention to deviations. Any deviation, any change is ignored because it doesn't help you move forward, right? And we're not paying attention really to details. You know, we're just looking at the world. We're only seeing the part of the world that applies to what we're actually doing. To the production. To the production. And systems two thinking is when we have to stop. That's where we learn. That's where we innovate. That's where we notice all of these organizational weaknesses. They're only latent, really, because we're in systems one performance mode. If we were in systems two mode, they wouldn't be hidden at all. <laughs> you know, we would be looking for them and learning from them. And and if we go to, to Wyke and sense making, right, right. and sense making is very systems one in the way that he talks about it, uh, it's not until we encounter some sort of emotional distress, something that's unavoidable, uh, some unavoidable problem that knocks us out of that systems one mode and puts us into systems two mode. And so we really should be celebrating all of these things that knock us out and force us into learning mode, essentially. But that's really a shocker for these guys because the value, <laughs> the, I mean, they keep scoring dollars, right? So dollars mm -hmm. are really important. And the value they have is in measuring production systems one. What system? What's the difference between system one and system two? System one is fast thinking. System one's fast thinking. System two is the slow thinking. So if we go from that book, thinking fast and slow, right? right? And so what he says, his his understanding of this all comes from his research about biases, and basically in systems one, we're stuck in much more, many more biases because what we're doing to think so fast is we're we're using lots of little shortcuts. Lots of little mnemonic kind of tools um, in order to in order to be able to think fast. Like you said, you know things like prejudice. Prejudice is useful. 
especially if it's based on a real yeah. experience, I, right? I, stereotypes are, are convenient <laughs> because they save time. So. Exactly. So it's the same thing. You're saving time. You're using those stereotypes. You're using those little thinking tools in order to, to have you work faster. But, I mean, it's quite remarkable when you think of that. When you think of the fact that the value, at least on the surface people see, is for being in production mindset. Because production mm-hmm. mindset is where we keep score. It's how we produce products, hence the name production mindset. It's how we get a paycheck. It's how we give value to the shareholders. Yeah. Right? And so the it seems like the game's rigged. Yeah. And it's rigged towards sort of systems one thinking. Right. When in fact systems two thinking is, is m- probably more valuable mm-hmm. to actually creating value for the shareholders. Ultimately. Um, making so where do we go with that? But it's certainly not an either or, or choice. It's a both and choice. Oh. And this is where we get back to paradoxes. Damn, these paradoxes are these par- everywhere. I know. You want things. I mean, the only reason something is seen as a paradox is because we're looking at it as an either or choice. It's either safety or it's, it's performance. And when, when it's an either or choice that you're focused on that conflict and you want to resolve the conflict by choosing one side or the other, that's where – you're not going to get anywhere. Well, so how much does that have to do with the fact that we see reliable performance, safety, production, quality, whatever you value, we see reliable performance as an outcome to be achieved. Right. Right, not a process to be managed. Right. And that's key. With If it's a process to be managed, then you integrate into the process the systems too, the learning all of those things in order to be able to continue to maintain that, maintain those outcomes. But organizations are, ter- they suck at learning. They're terrible at learning. <laughs> and, and actually you're giving me some pretty good thought fodder about why they suck at learning, but they still, they suck at learning. They suck at learning until they're forced to learn. Right. And then organizations that set out to be learning organizations suck sometimes at performing, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> what, what do they call it? Analysis paralysis? Uh-huh. I mean, coming out of a national laboratory like we both do, I mean, you really see, you see what an organization that puts extra special value on analysis looks like. Yeah. And it's an organization that doesn't do a lot of production, right? Right, right, I mean, exactly. So those things continue to be in conflict, but they're so interdependent. So how do we, and then this is, you know, talking to our systems engineers out there, how do we... And I and I know that people have developed systems that have their cooling period, right? That have their moments where learning is built in. And wouldn't it be better to plan when you are going to learn and dig for some pain when you have the time to dig for some pain than to have it assault you when you least expect it and have to shut down in order to be forced to learn? So how so I think the key is in our management systems and building those things in. It's just like going back to the analogy, the psychological analogy. You know, going to your therapist on Tuesday afternoons, you get to cry and you get to learn. <laughs> well, <it's>, so <laughs> technically, so the word that comes to mind when you when you say this is feedback, right? Yeah. And technically when we design systems, when we design technical the, a machine that makes candy, mm-hmm. right? There's going to be five or six places in that machine where they actually take the temperature of the product to ensure that it's the right temperature to go to the next step. Those feedback systems, I think we get this idea when we look at the world as a linear Newtonian function Mm -hmm. and we can understand and make systems that are technically uh, capable of feeding back and adjusting themselves. Right. Why can't we do this with the human systems, with the systems that work uh, to manage organizations? And the quick answer, maybe that's a dumb question, because the quick answer is humans aren't machines, right? So right. we don't have machine reliability. Well, and we don't. I mean, the thing is that makes it a little bit more goofy, I suppose, is that you don't know when you take a temperature what you're going to get. When you take a temperature in a candy-making machine, you have a range, right? And And you have already built in what your response is going to be to different points within that range. And with a human system, it's going to be a little bit more unpredictable, but that's where you get to innovate. I mean, that's where the real magic happens. Are there examples of organizations that do this well that you know of? That I know of that do this well. 
Um, you know, certainly at Harvard, we write a lot of case studies, and I've written, I've read and talked about a lot of case studies with organizations that sort of do this well, but the key of the case study is that it's messy and they're, you know, doing some things badly. But um, certainly the case studies that come to mind are ones around Amazon and ones around Zappos that were gathering information and also giving individuals the opportunities to problem solve. Certainly in the Zappos case, they they give uh, their customer service people the opportunity to problem solve and to come up with the come up with a solution however creatively that they want to. Knowing that customer service people are not getting problems that come from the drop-down menu that you get when you call on the phone and say, if your problem is this, press one, if your problem... But recognizing that a human being needs to assess that problem and also assess the other human being and what their needs are and then give them a solution that's specific to that human being. That's quite amazing, actually, and that's a big change in the paradigm that people use to manage organizations. I mean, right? Mm-hmm. So that's why Zappos and Amazon, I suppose Google falls into this category. They're seen as kind of novel organizations, right. free food, free candy, free sodas, <laughs> ping pong tables, right? Yeah. Sleeping rooms. That's all. Those are pretty extreme examples. Can we do that with an existing organization? Or, or maybe a better question is, is how would we do that? in an existing organization that doesn't maybe go to the extremes of a Zappos or an Amazon? Well, I mean, I think the key thing is looking at where decisions need to be made in your system and um, what is the decision-making process the one that's appropriate for that system and given how you're going to be getting feedback there. So if we go back to the Zappos exa- example with the customer service people, you know, just think of all all of the different variables there with what kind of problem they might be having and then who that person is and what's going to make them happy, right? I re- actually really like the way you're thinking because when we go out um, from our last conversation and identify a pain point, mm-hmm. right, we shift from system one thinking to system two thinking, right, mm-hmm. uh, somewhere either before the pain identification, but we're in system, we're learning, we're in system two thinking. We then realize that the context, the part of the pain that doesn't fit into the pull-down menu becomes really the opportunity for improvement. It's, it's, it's where learning happens, mm-hmm. which I would suggest you're exactly right, is messy as can be. I mean, that's right. super, super messy. Talk more about the shift into systems too, and talk more about how you've been thinking, because that always mm-hmm. interests me, about how we sort of encourage system two thinking. Well, you know, I mean, I think that the way that we're talking about it now, if we're going to somehow bring it into the organizational system, institutionalize it so that it's proactive rather than reactive, then we need to bring it into a process. And what we need to do is look at all, look at our organizational process and find the areas where it's most useful. So, uh, do you know if we have a problem on a line and it's the, then the worker stops it, but then they call somebody else to solve the problem on the line and they are no longer involved in it? There's a lot of feedback that's being that's being lost. And if the engineers that are there to fix the problem on the line are operating from an SOW that gives them, you know, five different options of five different problems, try and try and uh, you know, fit this problem into <laughs> into the set of solutions that you've been given, then you know that you're ha- hampering the system. And maybe within certain operations that's fine, but once we we get into human operations, that's just not going to cut it. So we often say the worker has to be a part of the problem identification and the problem solution. Right. But you're actually taking this one step further. You're saying the worker, the engineer, and the manager collectively have to be a part of the problem identification. They all have different perceptions of what the problem is and collectively a part of the problem solution. That, I would suggest, is relatively it's not controversial. It's relatively exciting because, <laughs> right. because that's not how problem solving techniques happen, generally speaking, on the manufacturing floor. Right. The worker works. This is classic Taylorism. The worker works. Mm-hmm. The engineer engineers. The maintenance guy does maintenance. 
and never the twain shall meet, which mm-hmm. is you're telling me um, a real weakness, not in our system, although it is a weakness in our system, it's a weakness in our thinking. Is that what I'm right, hearing? Right. And we have to open ourselves up to other contexts. You reminded me of a, a process that I was involved in uh, for a large pharmaceutical company where they had a supply chain issue. Well, the Six Sigma engineers went in there and they looked at the whole thing and they couldn't figure out what the issue was. So the head of HR thought, okay, well, if it's not something the Six Sigma engineers can figure out, then then I'm going to bring in... Um, I'm going to bring in people who are experts in human beings instead of in systems and see if they can figure it out. So we got together. We went through an appreciative inquiry process, and that might be something to talk about in the future. But we went through the appreciative inquiry process, and we figured out that the supply chain issue essentially came down to sort of human perception and people trying to be polite and people trying to take care of each other. So as you know, in the pharmaceutical industry, there has been a lot and lot of mergers and acquisitions. So this was an organization that was in the throes of mergers and acquisitions. It was a supply chain problem with plants that they had brought in via acquisition. And there were uh, managers uh, who were getting feedback from these different plants in order to feed into their supply chain system. Well, you know, these managers were human beings and they felt bad for these plants that these plant managers who had just had their whole lives upheaved, who were trying to fit their unique operations into the operation of this gigantic conglomerate. And they were essentially giving them a break and they were giving them a break by giving them more time, but not wanting to get them in trouble, they were kind of fibbing when they would add information into the supply chain system. So they were creating a little bit of buffer for these guys so that they had time to get on board. Um, But they, you know, they did it in a way so because of the of the penalties that were involved in not meeting the performance requirements, they did it in a way where nobody would get a penalty. That's remarkable, actually. The, I mean, that's and so no Six Sigma inju- that would never show up in the Six Sigma data. No, only by sitting down and talking about it. And after hours and hours, yeah, yeah, yeah. did you were you able to start and thinking from it from different people's point of view and also thinking about the context of what was going on during that time and knowing about, you know, what human beings are like and what the culture of the organization is like, they were trying to take care of each other. So how do we create more systems to thinking time? What do we do? How do we create more systems to thinking time? We uh, find opportunities within the organizational process where we are going to have sort of the most messy feedback (laughs) and we stop. We build the stopping into the process. How do we manage the messy feedback? (laughs) Because I I know exactly what you say (laughs) when you say messy feedback, but I wonder if companies are prepared to go into that level because it's really a loss of control or the perception yeah. of a loss of control right. in the management. Well, it's just what you do, Todd. It's that noodling time, right? It's noodling. It's it's all of the stuff that we worry about, you know, that we're goofing off when we're really not goofing off. Remember when uh, – you, you, okay, I remember when I first became a manager and – I realized how important networking was for me to bring resources to my team and for me to get the information that I need for my team to be successful. But I was such a type A high performance individual contributor that the thought of wandering around chatting with people uh, was felt like goofing off. And I really thought, you know, I saw it as negative, as uh, as playing politics, as all of that stuff, even though conceptually I knew it was important. That was the only way I was going to get the team the things that it needed. 
I had to get over that and recognize that it was part of my job to, you know, to have to build a rapport with my peers and and with the people above me. That's so interesting and so important. I think we should fart around more. We should we should build relationships more. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. In, in order to create system to thinking time. Yeah. In order to create an opportunity to learn. And there you have it. The secret to life is noodling time. Man, I'm glad we got that one covered quickly. What do you think? I actually think this one was amazing. And it fits beautifully on what Martha talked about on the first podcast. They really travel together pretty nicely. So I have to hurry and kind of get off uh, get off the dime and get this one out there so you guys can listen to both of them. I do think this one really builds in a strong argument for the notion of operational learning. Um, stopping is what Martha called it, but I think stopping is really the, maybe the first step to learning and pausing, listening to small signals, understanding that weak signals have powerful impacts. All those things become really, really important. But what I found most interesting in this podcast was her premise that how we think, you know, the mode we're thinking in, uh, system one or system two, thinking fast or thinking slow dramatically influences what we listen to and what we see. And our challenge is, I think as professionals, understanding how humans perform is really thinking about how we go and look at our systems to understand the product that those systems create. And that challenge, as always, is what we do for a living. So that's the podcast. Thanks for listening. Be sure to tell your friends. That makes a huge difference. Ask them to subscribe. That's very important in podcasting worlds. And most importantly, tell us what you're thinking because I can do as many of these as you have time to listen. But I want to make sure that we know that this is our chance to have a conversation. Listen carefully because there's more coming. In fact, the next one we're going to talk about why we ought to look at moving towards the new view. That's episode three. Special thanks to Martha Acosta and really special thanks to you. Thanks for being a part of this conversation. This is the Pre-Accident Podcast. I'm Todd Conklin. Be safe.